get started. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome stakeholders turn, turning, tuning in uh, to today's audio webcast. Uh, today's meeting will include reports from our FASB chairman, the GASB chairman, our FAF president and CEO, and our FAF treasurer. We'll also receive reports about the latest activities of the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council and the Governmental Accounting Standards Advisory Council, and we will receive a report from the Trustees Standard Setting Process Oversight Committee. Before we get to the reports, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our new F newest FASB member, Marsha Hunt. Marsha, who is with us here today, uh, joined the FASB on July 1st from Cummins, Inc., where she served as Vice President and Corporate Controller. Marsha was responsible for external reporting, consolidations, finance systems, accounting policy, insurance risk management, and Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. As a financial statement preparer, Marsha brings vast experience and broad knowledge of financial accounting and reporting issues facing large public companies. At the conclusion of our committee, committee meetings yesterday, we were honored as a board to meet with SEC Chairman Jay Clayton and Chief Accountant Wes Bricker. It was a great opportunity to share with Chairman Clayton and Mr. Bricker some of the issues that are important to us and our stakeholders and to hear their views about current matters in the areas of accounting and financial reporting. We look forward to continuing our dialogue with Chairman Clayton, the other SEC commissioners, and the SEC staff in the months ahead. I also wanted to take this opportunity to provide an update on some items that the trustees discussed in closed session earlier today. This morning, the Board of Trustees appointed new private company council members to succeed the three current PCC members whose terms expire at the end of this year. Jeremy Dillard, a practitioner, is a partner with Singer Lewick, LLP, and will be succeeding Jeff Bryan. Frank Tarallo, a preparer, is the Chief Executive Officer at Theragenics Corporation and will be succeeding Larry Weinstock. <coughs> Dev Strychuk, a financial statement user, is a recently retired Senior Vice President and Senior Credit Policy Officer, Corporate Risk Management at SunTrust Banks, Inc., and will be succeeding Steve Brown. The trustees also decided to add a member to the PCC with a private company financial statement user background. To that end, the trustees appointed Michael Minnis, an associate professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Michael's academic research focuses primarily on the capital market impacts of auditing and preparing private company financial statements. With Michael's appointment, the PCC will increase in size from 10 to 11 members. The new PCC members will start their three-year terms on January 1st, 2018. Although they still have a few months left in their tenure, we want to take this opportunity to thank the soon-to-be departing PCC members, Jeff, Larry, and Steve, for their commitment to helping improve financial accounting and reporting for private companies. We will issue an announcement on these appointments this afternoon. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I would like to express thanks to all of our stakeholders who submitted nominees for the PCC through the new portal on the FAF website. As is always the case, we received a very strong group of nominees, making the selection process that much more difficult for the trustees. However, as we can all appreciate, an excess of strong candidates is a good problem for us to have. Also this morning, we discussed the status of a number of appointments for which our process is continuing. There are three trustee seat openings, one governmental seat to succeed Charles Cox, and two at-large trustee seats to succeed Anne Marie Petock and John Dugan, and one FASB seat opening to succeed Mark Siegel next year. The appointments process for these roles is underway, and our goal is to finalize these selections later this year. <coughs> Lastly, this morning, the trustees discussed other strategic matters, including an update on Washington, D.C. matters, an update on the FASB and GASB technical agendas, and we will hear more on each of these matters during Russ, Dave, and Terry's reports this morning. With that, let's move on to our regular agenda. The first item of business is to approve the minutes from the board's May 16th and 17th meeting. May I have a motion? Second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstain? Okay, thank you. 
With that, let's move to the report of the Standard Setting Process Oversight Committee, and I'll ask Terry Warfield and Nancy Kopp to fill us in. Thank you, Chuck. I'm going to lead off uh, as the co-chair of the committee. Uh, the committee met yesterday. Um, we had a full agenda, and highlights are that uh, the two board chairs, Russ and Dave, reported on significant agenda items and other matters of importance, of all, as always. Uh, they'll be giving their report in a few minutes, and uh, they uh, will provide more detail. Let me sh share a few key items from the committee standpoint. Uh, one item that uh, we've been following is Russ and Dave both described their recent implementation and education activities. Uh, and these are important given the kind of major projects that have come online uh, in the recent past. On the FASB side, uh, the board and staff are monitoring implementation of revenue recognition, leases, and credit losses, and Russ was able to tell us the nature of the activities in that space, um, and that seems on track. On the GASB side, uh, Dave reported on OPEB implementation and education around their financial reporting model project, which is uh, well underway, uh, processing feedback, and, uh, and you know, th those are the important highlights there. They also, uh, from both perspectives of the FASB and the GASB, uh, educated or brought the committee up to date on their speaking engagement programs, uh, which are important uh, avenues for outreach to stakeholders. Uh, they helped explain how they decide who to speak to, why, criteria they use to uh, decide on speeches, and uh, so that was very useful to help the committee understand the overall, uh, that aspect of their stakeholder outreach. Now earlier today, Russ and Dave also updated the trustees on their technical agendas and strategic matters, and uh, at the committee yesterday, they committee meeting yesterday, they talked to us about the progress they've made on their non-technical goals for the year, and that relates mainly to the standard setting process, um, and related to some of the things I already talked about, investor education and, and various uh, modes of engagement with advisory groups. <clears throat> so the second uh, aspect of my part of the report is related to PCC matters, uh, and of course the PCC came under, uh, oversight of the PCC came under the oversight committee uh, this year. And so there always has a prominent position in our agenda. Uh, we discussed the July PCC meeting, the second of the year. Uh, committee member Diane Rubin and I both attended that meeting. Uh, Diane, did you want to kind of give a couple of observations on that meeting and then I'll follow up with mine? Sure. Um, the meeting uh, was a very, a very good one with. Um, with excellent participation by the PCC members and the FASB members, good interaction. Um, several important subjects were discussed, including variable interest entities and balance sheet classification. So it was a very good meeting. Thank you, Diane. And I think from my perspective, uh, we were able to observe, uh, Diane and I were able to observe the TIC meeting, the uh, technical, in technical Inquiry Committee, I think it's called. <laughs> Uh, that they held with the PCC following the PCC meeting, and that, and that was also a very uh, engaging conversation. The PCC members took a great uh, lead role in the interaction with the TIC group. Uh, Harold Monk, the FASB liaison to the PCC, and Russ Golden also provided their perspectives on the July PCC meeting, as well as progress being made by both the PCC and the FASB on projects related to public, uh, private company stakeholders. Um, so that concludes my part of the report, and I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Nancy. Thank you. Um, one of the major items before the committee this year was the review of the GASB scope of authority uh, consultation process. Um, as you know, the, the GASB scopes, scope one, everything is, is within scope. Scope three uh, are items that potentially are out of the scope of the agreed upon uh, 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 
GASB arena and scope two are, group two are in between. The fact of the matter is since the policy was adopted, uh, um, th there has been no proposal for an item that is not in group one scope. But, uh, uh, but nonetheless, it seemed appropriate to do a review of the, of the system. So, uh, so we did. The policy that was issued outlined a pre-agenda consultation process for the GASB and the standard setting uh, oversight committee to follow in determining whether information the GASB might consider for a, uh, for a standard setting uh, is in fact financial accounting and reporting information that is group one within scope. And the policy calls for the FAF, for this board, uh, to review the effectiveness three years after the implementation of this scope of authority uh, uh, system. So we performed because, as I mentioned, we haven't had an issue outside of group one scope uh, at this point, performed a limited review um, uh, to, to gather information about how it, it has worked so far and how the people who were involved in creating the system thought it had played out. Um, and uh, the staff undertook a series of uh, interviews with, uh, with interested and involved parties. And then we met with the GAS Act, which as you know, is representative of the total range of the, of the uh, diverse stakeholders. And basically the conclusion of all of these people was that uh, the, uh, the, the scope of authority process should remain in place, that it has been useful, that it ought to be re-examined within the next five years by this board, and uh, that uh, uh, un until then, it should essentially remain uh, as it is, um, and we'll see what happens. So there is a resolution, Mr. Chairman, on page uh, 156 of, uh, of our packet, which in fact would uh, have the board adopt that, uh, that proposal. I move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstain? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I think it's important to note that all of the participants, some were not supportive of the system in the beginning, some uh, were, I think all agree that it has been smooth so far and appreciate the fact that this board, um, of which I won't be a member at that point, is going to be on top of it and watching and reviewing. Uh, with that, the, the only other thing we have is uh, the trustee reports on observations of meetings. As you know, one of the functions of the board, but particularly of the Process Oversight Committee, is to oversee the process. And that includes uh, attending meetings such as, most recently, a GAS Act meeting that uh, uh, actually Charles and Eloise and I attended. And, hmm? Terry. and Terry. And actually the, this, uh, the scope of authority process was discussed there and uh, the role of the, uh, as I mentioned, the diverse members of the GAS Act in the whole process was, uh, was stressed by the, uh, the chair and by uh, Dave Bean and I think that uh, everybody has sort of re, um, reaffirmed uh, their active interest and participation in not only receiving information from staff, approving information of staff, but actually participating significantly in discussions and uh, decisions. And it was really a very good meeting, I think. I commend you. And then Chris Cumming attended uh, the IAC meeting and Ken uh, the FASB meeting. So I can start by saying a word about the um, uh, Investor Advisory Committee meeting. A uh, very worthwhile meeting. Uh, clear perspective coming from the, uh, from the committee on uh, some uh, key issues around materiality 
and ways to improve tax, income tax disclosures, but also a meeting where people were working hard on tough issues where it's uh, the real question is can you make things better, not necessarily perfect. Uh, very impressed by the engagement of the committee, especially in the breakout sessions as well as the general discussion. Great interaction with the board members who were primarily in listening mode. And um, I must say also very impressed by the candor. There were questions where, you know, there were many more doubts than there were, was uh, endorsement of uh, particular ideas. And uh, the committee was not hesitant to, to raise the issues. Good. Uh, I will comment on uh, my uh, attendance to the uh, financial instrument hedging uh, meeting and uh, the uh, revenue recognition uh, for grants and contracts uh, session. Uh, on both of these topics, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, presenters uh, were well prepared and uh, there were you know, follow-ups from prior uh, discussions. The framework for the uh, discussion and the pre-read material made it very conducive for someone you know, joining uh, the discussion to be able to quickly connect on the issues and the topics. The staff presented the material uh, clearly, succinctly, and handled questions well uh, from the board members. Uh, particularly uh, on the uh, financial hedge accounting, there was a robust discussion by uh, the uh, uh, board uh, with uh, strong points of views on certain issues. And in cases where there were strong uh, points of views, the board members sought to understand the staff's point of view, probe for the rationale for the position. In a couple of instances, they were willing to change their position after dialogue or conclude that they could support uh, the issue uh, despite seeing it somewhat differently. Uh, overall, I thought there was healthy debate and dialogue, as I said, particularly on the uh, hedge accounting one. And I would say, uh, from my perspective, it was a uh, great session uh, on two uh, particularly meaty topics uh, that I had an opportunity uh, to uh, participate in. As a board member, it provided me a uh, good uh, opportunity to see the board members in action, how they uh, uh, address different points of views and reconcile those positions in order to uh, move forward uh, with uh, these two, two uh, uh, issues. Thank you. Let, uh, I'd just like to add that uh, I think how important it is for the trustees who, <coughs> after all, um, have to both oversee the process of the standard setting uh, boards and the standard setting process and make sure that the right people are in the right uh, places do take advantage of the opportunity either to visit the meetings in person or those that are televised or uh, audio broadcasted. I have to admit that sitting two days in a row a couple of weeks ago watching the GASB was uh, riveting. Was riveting. <laughs> it, was, it was a terrific experience. Um, but also a very, very encouraging and enlightening one because that was another example of really quite thorough discussion and uh, 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 disagreement and then uh, consensus. And it, uh, I, I really was uh, very impressed. So with that, are there, are there questions of any of these folks? If not, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nancy. Terry, um, why don't we turn to Russ Golden's report. Russ. Sure. Thank you. My former report begins on master page 157. Um, I'd highlight some of the more significant activities that the FASB uh, did in the second quarter as well as uh, subsequent to the second quarter. In the second quarter, the board issued two final documents and four exposure drafts. Uh, I'd like to highlight the exposure draft associated with consolidation, targeted improvements uh, to related party guidance for variable interest entities. This was uh, a document where we worked closely with the PCC and other private company community to, to make changes um, that we think will, uh, at least some of us think, uh, will um, significantly reduce the uncertainty to the application of what's called the related party tiebreaker test. Uh, those of you that are interested would be happy to explain that to you after the meeting. <laughs> um, some of the more significant changes we made to the standard setting agenda, uh, focusing on emerging trends and underlying transactions. The FASB asked the EITF to take the lead on improving the accounting related to cloud computing arrangements. And there has been one uh, meeting, and we do expect subsequent meetings of the EITF in the near term. The board also added, as part of our conceptual framework project, 
to look and refresh and perhaps clarify some of the definitions of elements of financial um, financial statements. Uh, we did have an active project on our agenda associated with measurement and presentation. And we are aware that there is some confusion out there in the definition of assets and liabilities. And we thought we'd take the opportunity to see if there's some changes that we can make to clarify, to clarify that. The board made significant decisions in a simplification initiative associated with improving liabilities <coughs> and equities, specifically around down rounds. And based on the advice of the PCC, the board did finalize that subsequent to the second quarter and issued uh, uh, an improvement that we think will uh, both reduce costs and improve financial reporting. The board also uh, put out for a proposal um, a clarification to help not-for-profits understand when the transactions are a grant or donation versus a contract with a, with a customer. And the board in the second quarter completed all of the deliberations in the balloting process associated with our accounting for financial <coughs> instrument hedge accounting. And I'm happy to say that we do expect to issue that in final form next week. There'll be a substantially communication rollout associated with that issuance uh, for, ne for next week. Uh, in the second quarter, we uh, all members of the board and the technical director did attend the PCC meeting where we had very good discussions about consolidation, liabilities, and equity and also an improvement to the documentation requirements for hedge accounting. And the PCC's advice will be incorporated in the final hedging document. Um, the, the two members of the board did attend with the PCC a joint discussion at the AICPA National Advanced Accounting and Auditing Technical Symposium, better known as NATS. And next week, Harold Monk and I will be heading to Atlanta to also attend a joint roundtable with members of the PCC. We find these important to understand what are some uh, types of technical discussions the private company community is having, and it's important that members of the board periodically go to these types of town halls. So we're Harold and I are looking forward to, to the trip to, uh, to Atlanta. In the second quarter, uh, we hosted um, a credit loss transition resource group where five topics were discussed with um, the members of the TRG. Those were the only five topics that had been raised by our stakeholders three of which were addressed at the table. Uh, all minutes associated with the TRG uh, are available for public consumption. The other two, we, we asked the staff to do research, and the board is looking forward to, to that research and discussion in the near term. On master page 162, thought I'd talk about some of the improvements we made to stakeholder education and communication. In the second quarter, the FASB held various educational webinars, uh, one associated with uh, updating not-for-profits in the private company community. Christine Bodison and the FASB staff discussed the importance of the conceptual framework, how the board uses that. And the primary uh, reason for that is we wanted our stakeholders to begin to understand the importance of the conceptual framework so as we move forward in these projects, we can have a better, more robust engagement with our stakeholders uh, about the changes that we are proposing in the conceptual framework. Um, other members of the FASB and staff talked about the importance of uh, getting academic research in the standard setting uh, arena. And finally, um, under the leadership of Mark Siegel, we did begin to host uh, a series of webinars uh, related to the rollout of revenue recognition, specifically 606, and we did it with various industries. So there were two that were done um, in the second quarter, and we do expect more. Uh, those have been well received by the investment community, and I like to thank Mark and Jim and, and Cullen's leadership in, put, in putting these together. Uh, and we look forward to doing more of those types of, uh, of webinars to help educate the investors, not only in revenue recognition, but the other standards, uh, major standards that we uh, have put forward uh, closer to the, uh, to the effective dates. That concludes my uh, formal remarks. Happy to answer any questions the trustees have. Questions for Russ? Terry? Actually, this question is for Christine. Uh, Russ mentioned the academic uh, community <coughs> outreach, and I noticed that the FASB now has a web page dedicated to academics and, and actually uh, some elements to um, engender or communicate the role of academic, that academic research can play in the standard setting process. So. I think it's been out there about a month now. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how that's being received. Certainly. Um, I was just recently at the American Accounting Association annual meeting and, and had a chance to speak with some of the members of the academic community. And, 
got very positive uh, feedback and response to having that landing page for academics. Um, in particular, uh, the uh, link to resources for teaching. Uh, we have a number of resources, as Russ was just describing, that are very useful in the classroom um, for the faculty members' own education, but then also for the education of, of their students. And so I think they uh, very much appreciate having a one-stop place where they can go to get access to all of the great materials that we have on the website that might be of use to them. And I, I think it's going to be um, a great resource for the academic community and also help strengthen the bridge between the board and that community. Other questions? Uh, yeah. uh, I, I do, Russ. Um, I've asked you, I asked you about this a couple weeks ago, but I saw over the last month or so in, in, in the press that a few accounting firms and others have put out surveys on the readiness of implementation of the major uh, standards uh, changes that were adopted in 2014 and 2015. And the question is, what is the board's process in evaluating these surveys, first of all, and the readiness of companies to implement the, the changes? Sure. Um, we, we devote a substantial amount of resources to um, understand the status of implementation, to understand is there um, uh, things that the board could do to clarify our stakeholders' understanding? Are there things the board could do to potentially reduce the cost um, or to narrow uh, potential diversity? Um, that was why we created the transition resource groups, both for revenue and for credit losses. Uh, we have board members mm -hmm. assigned to lead the uh, efforts. Hal, as you know, is in charge of credit losses. Jim's in charge of revenue recognition. When leases w came out, we chose not to create a transition resource group, but we asked Mark Siegel to lead the effort. And what we do is we ask uh, each of the, those members of the board, as well as other members of the board and the staff, to monitor what, uh, what is occurring. But specifically related to surveys, we do read the results of the survey, uh, uh, and we ask questions to those types of companies, or in this case, professional accounting firms that put out the survey. And we're in constant contact to see if there's anything we need to do. Uh, on our agenda today, there's a couple of improvements related to classification, measurement, and leases. There's a practical expedient that we think will reduce costs related to leases. In the past, there's been practical expedients and improvements made to revenue recognition. And we think all of that helps our stakeholders be in a position to adopt the standards in, in revenue uh, the beginning of next year and leases uh, the beginning of 19 and credit losses beginning the beginning of 2020. So we closely monitor it and our view is to have an open uh, relationship with all of our stakeholders so that we can help them uh, manage uh, this change and be in a position to understand what, what the board expects. John? Thanks. <clears throat> Russ, I, I just got an XBRL question. I know Hal's been working on that, so maybe this is uh, Hal for you, but uh, I think as we all recall in the um, in the budget order uh, for FAF earlier this year, the SEC asked the FASB to conduct a study and look at the efficiency effectiveness of XBRL. Um, just wanted to get a sense of how that's going. Do you have any update, any early observations for us? And when do you think we'll see kind of the final outcome of that report? Okay, let me let me give you a, a, a quick uh, summary of what I what I know is going on so far. Yes, we've held uh, several meetings with advisory groups. We've yeah. held a roundtable. The staff has pulled all the information together, and they are currently drafting up their recommendations based on, on what they heard. Uh, give you a quick summary. Kind of three broad areas of improvement. One is education. Another is on uh, the quality of data. And a third is on the consistency of application of XBRL. Uh, the good news in terms of education, uh, stakeholders all like what they're getting in terms of education, and they want more. It's good, and we can even use more of that, particularly in implementation guides. In terms of data quality, there's been a persistent issue of tagging information. And that issue, I guess, is best seen by the fact that there are roughly uh, 8,700 or so companies in the universe that file XBRL data. 
Uh, they generate about 27, 28 million data points that are tagged each year. And that's uh, gotten us to about a point of about 150 million data points so <laughs> far. That's the good news. A lot of data is being built up in the system that's uh, retrievable. Five out of six data points are easily retrievable because they use a standard tag. One out of every six uses an extension, kind of a non-standard tag. And like anything, it, the five out of six work really well in the system. The one out of six require a lot of human intervention. What we've heard is, can we fix a problem here to get that number of extensions down so they can be processed more quickly? Uh, there are some recommendations in the report that talk about anchoring and ways to do that. The third area is consistency of application. There's something like 13,000 tags in the system today, um, and there are two paths to figure out which is the best tag for a particular number. One path is through the codification, one's through the taxonomy. Through the codification is the better approach, but unfortunately there's some rough spots where you can't make the connection between the accounting standard and the tag that would be required for that. Staff has been working on it, they're aware of it, they're going to need some more resources to kind of complete it. But I would say those are the three broad areas. Thanks. And so we should have that wrapped up, or staff should have that wrapped up in the next month or two. Okay. Are there questions for Russ, I guess, or his colleagues? Okay. Thank you, Russ. Thanks, everyone. All right. Let's turn to the FACE Act chair reports. Andy McMaster. Thank you. Uh, the FACE Act chair report can be found on master page 171 in your materials. Uh, that report includes the activities of FASAC uh, through the end of June, uh, and I'd like to highlight some recent and upcoming activities. Uh, starting with the June 15th FASAC meeting, which included breakout discussions on two broad topics, uh, technology and financial reporting and the application of materiality to financial statement disclosures. Uh, and as I get into that, I'd also like to thank Myra Drucker for having attended as an observer. Uh, we always appreciate having one of the, the uh, trustees attend. Uh, that first topic, technology, is one that's likely going to garner additional interest in the future. And, and, and at the end of my remarks, I'll, I'll give some, some insights in terms of, of what we think that may consider. Uh, as we prepared for our discussion on technology the following day, we invited uh, Pranav Guy, the CEO and co-founder of CalcBench, to be our dinner speaker. It was an interesting discussion. CalcBench is a company that uses XBRL data that Hal just described to create a platform that permits users to analyze publicly available information in what they believe is a faster, smarter, and better way. Uh, he also shared with us how his company uses that electronic data to provide services to investors and other financial statement users. It was a good foundation for our, our discussion the following day. Uh, in that discussion, we discussed how the evolution of technology has changed or will change both the preparation of financial statements and the, uh, the consumption of that financial statement information by users and others. Uh, council members observed a number of, of uh, matters. Uh, first, that the increases in the amount of information companies are generating and efficiencies they can gain from the use of technology is very substantial. Uh, however, there are differences between what large companies are able to do and the resources that they have in order to accommodate that versus the smaller companies where those costs can be very significant. Uh, council members also noted that technical, technological advances have been adopted more readily in the consumption of financial information by users as opposed to the preparers. And again, that is probably driven by the relative cost of the use of technology in those two different sectors. Uh, we, al we also discussed the frequency of financial reporting and the effect technology may have on that uh, and whether and how technology should impact the standard setting process itself. Lastly, there was a discussion regarding the efficiency and effectiveness of XBRL. In terms of uh, future uh, agenda items relating to technology, two topics came up. One was around the, the, uh, the topic of digital currencies, and the other was around blockchain technology. The second item that we discussed was the application of materiality uh, within the context of financial statement disclosures. Here, council members made a number of observations. Uh, first. The definition of materiality and the use of the SEC staff accounting uh, bulletin number 99, noting that this definition is the one that is most commonly applied. Investors and other financial statement users express concern about the volume of disclosures, uh, both, both parties, but importantly, uh, in particular, users were concerned about how determinations are made when that information is omitted and why. Uh, lastly, council members generally agree that omissions of, a, of an immaterial disclosure uh, should not be considered an accounting error or reporting error. Uh, 
At our upcoming meeting in September, which will be September 12th, we have two topics that we want to uh, take on. The first is the role of the conceptual framework as it relates to the standard setting process. Uh, and secondly, and this is primarily for the benefit of the members itself, getting a better understanding of how the FASB considers the cost and benefit of the standards that they are in fact uh, 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 coming up with. We thought it was important for us to understand how they consider uh, the, the implications of all the, all the economic consequences of the standard setting process mm -hmm. as we deliberate on, uh, the, or I should say discuss, the various topics we have. Uh, we are also in the process of considering the vacancies and nominations for the vacancies that we will have this coming year. Uh, we're looking for uh, input from this body as well as others for recommendations of qualified candidates uh, to step in. Uh, we're looking for nominations from financial statement preparers, uh, investors, and other financial statement users, and uh, we will have a vacancy for an academic uh, on the, uh, the, the on FASEC this coming year. In that context, the executive director and I will be meeting with the appointments committee on September 22nd uh, to talk about our forward-looking thoughts in terms of how uh, we believe we ought to think about the, the longer-term appointment process for FASEC members. That concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to respond to any questions. Any questions for Andy? Okay, thank you, Andy. Dave Vaught. All right, Jill. Yes, Find my report beginning on page 176 of your packet. Just a few highlights from the second quarter. Um, we did issue four final pronouncements, uh, two standards, one on certain debt extinguishment issues and one on leases. Also issued an implementation guide update, our annual update for 2017, and then also a separate implementation guide for other post-employment benefits to health care retiree type costs uh, for the plan side. Um, you also see that uh, we issued two documents for public comment, the first being an exposure draft on certain debt disclosures, including direct borrowings and direct placements, and an exposure draft for an implementation guide on OPEB related to the employer side. So those were the things that were issued. I would also comment that um, after the due uh, process document that we issued at the end of 2016 on the financial reporting model, um, during the second quarter, we held five public hearings and three user forums around the United States um, to gather additional input. You'll also see that on the standard setting agenda that we had no new projects that we added to the agenda in the second quarter. And the last thing I would point out is just that in the pre-agenda research area, we did add two additional research topics. The first being information technology arrangements, including cloud computing. Um, as Russ mentioned, they're looking at this same issue, so our project teams will be closely coordinating the research and things that we're doing on that particular project. And then the last uh, research topic was pro public-private partnerships, um, taking a look at P3s and the changes that are taking place in those activities. And that completes my report. Take any questions. Okay. Charles, question? Yeah, Dave, you mentioned in your report that an exposure draft was issued for debt disclosures. Can you uh, give us an idea of what the catalyst was for that? <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. I think it was primarily the user community. In fact, we heard it first through our advisory council. Um, and the real concern there centered on the fact that with more direct placements and direct borrowings, um, some covenants in those particular agreements tend to be um, non-disclosed or a little different than we do find in a public offering of debt. And so the user community was concerned whether we're getting adequate disclosures, especially in some cases where um, the debt, the direct debt, had the ability to be called under certain circumstances and take preference over for bonds. So that was a real driver. But once we did our research, we felt it was really good to step back and look at debt disclosures in general. So we did a comprehensive review instead of just the direct borrowing, direct placement. Eloise. Dave, uh, we see lots of media coverage about pensions and the GASB's new standards. What is the current status of the implementation of the new standards on other post-employment benefits like uh, retiree health care? Yeah. Um, the plans are actually implemented at effective June 30th, 2017, so they're in the process right now if they have a plan. The employer side takes effect in June 30th, 2018 and later. Um, when I talk to stakeholder groups, I always remind them that they really need to focus on OPEB. Um, we know there's a lot of attention given to the pension side of things, but the pension side is typically funded, at least partially funded, maybe 60, 70, 80 percent funded. Many of the OPEB plans are not funded at all. 
So when you take a look at it, you're going to present this net OPEB liability, but if you have no assets to set offset against it, that liability could actually exceed the pension liability that's getting all the attention right now. So if you have significant OPEB uh, promises, it's going to be a big statement for people to be implementing and getting the right attention to it. Other questions for Dave? Chris. Yes, I actually have a question for David Bean. Uh, and we're about halfway through a, a big technology renewal here. Um, and I wondered if you could comment on how that's impacting workflow, uh, especially last year we implemented SharePoint. This year we were implementing CRM. Workflow, and how's the team uh, adjusting to the new environment? Thank you, Christine, for the question. Uh, I think the transition has been going smoothly, and I think we can directly attribute that to the uh, collaborative effort of the working committee. That's, you know, the foundation, is the FASB and it's the GASB working together. Um, now I don't want to sound completely like Pollyanna. I mean, there's been bumps along the way, but the working committee has been um, great in quickly addressing issues if they come forward. And when you start talking about the benefits, certainly from, a, again, a collaborative effort on the, on the staff standpoint, uh, SharePoint has, has been helpful. Uh, but we're also going to see, I think, great benefits from CRM. Um, you know, things that we've, the group has talked about before as far as managing relations, um, providing better analysis of data as far as stakeholder relationships are concerned is important. But one of the things that we really haven't focused on is, is the, our transition efforts as far as succession uh, planning. Um, give you an example, Ken Sherman, uh, who's a senior technical advisor at GASB, he's been with GASB since September 4th. 1984. GASB started June 14, 1984. <laughs> and, um, you know, when Ken retires on September 5th, uh, after 33 years with GASB, there's going to be this big sucking sound of knowledge <laughs> um, leave the board. And, uh, you know, it's, it's things like the CRM um, that, you know, we can't take Ken's brain, uh, but uh, we can certainly leave at least a part of his knowledge behind as part of our, our CRM. And, and hopefully we will do that as we see the senior staff retire, you know, over the next several years. And, um, and we're really hoping that that knowledge and, and those relationships and, and interactions with stakeholders can be incorporated in the CRM so that that will benefit standard setting in the future. Great, thank you. Other, other questions? Sue, Cosper, I, I assume that what Dave was saying about that knowledge base of CRM translates equally well for the FASB? That's correct, yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the uh, GASAC chair report. Robert Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my report covers the uh, second quarter of 2017, similar to the FASAC report. Uh, the council met on uh, June 26th and 27th in conjunction with the Healthcare Financial Management Association's annual National Institute. It's an example on, on how we attempt, if, if feasible to try and meet with a constituent organization uh, on their turf, so to speak, and, uh, and get feedback directly from them, not just through their representative on the council. Uh, we did, as uh, Nancy indicated, uh, we were fortunate to have uh, the three government trustees, uh, Trustee Cox, Trustee Kopp, and Trustee Foster join us as, along with Terry Poley. So we appreciate um, uh, your interest in the council's activities. We did uh, provide feedback. The council discussed uh, several technical agenda topics and provided feedback, including on the financial reporting model project and some of the other projects indicated in Chairman Bout's report, including equity interest ownership, uh, revenue and expense recognition, which I think is one that's going to, uh, Vice Chair Praviti is going to is in charge of, and uh, it's going to be an interesting topic for, for the council members going forward because it's more conceptual in, in, and um, uh, it's not as concrete. And so I think there's a, it, will, it will challenge some of us uh, on the council to, to uh, provide uh, appropriate feedback to the board and the staff. Um, we also discussed a potential practice issue project relating to conduit debt obligation disclosures which was also discussed in, in the chairman's report. Uh, 
consistent with what we've added over the last year, we uh, have continued the agenda item to solicit stakeholder input relative to getting uh, identifying emerging, emerging practice issues. There were five issues that were identified by council members, including a pledge of future revenues to pension plans, going concern issues relative to pension funding, application of the criteria from GASB Statement 84, fiduciary activities to OPEB plans, government agencies servicing mortgages from other states, and the last was natural resources accounting. So it's an opportunity for the constituent organization representatives to bring items to the board's attention uh, for potential future research or ultimately the technical agenda. Um, another aspect that, as you're aware, we do annually and did at the previous meeting earlier in the year is the prioritization process uh, for uh, technical agenda and research items. One item that consistently is in, ranked in the top 10 uh, is interest in the monitoring activities of the board with respect to electronic financial reporting. And we were fortunate at our meeting in June to have the Assistant Director of the Office of Structured Disclosure at the SEC give us a, a very interesting presentation about XBRL and, uh, I, and how it might uh, ultimately be uh, uh, implemented with respect to government financial statements, not just uh, public companies. Uh, the Executive Committee, uh, met and the dates and determined the dates and locations for our meetings in 2018. The March and July meetings will be held in Norwalk and the October meeting will be held in New York. A couple other uh, items of note that aren't specifically in the written report, I uh, just want to note the, the passing of one of our members of the council, Dick Larkin, who represented the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. Uh, Dick always provided passionate and sometimes entertaining commentary at council meetings. Uh, but always with a view of, of improving financial reporting and, and, uh, and he will be missed. Uh, we also do, uh, are in the process of soliciting nominations for uh, council members whose terms are up or council members who can be reappointed uh, for consideration by the trustees at your meeting in November. And then lastly, with respect to the scope of authority, uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to participate in that process and have the GAS Act uh, provide input uh, to uh, to that review. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the next meeting of the GAS Act will be held in October, October 30th and 31st uh, near LaGuardia Airport here in New York City. And uh, as always, we would welcome uh, any attendance uh, as your schedules might permit from the trustees. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Robert. Any questions for Robert? I think the amount of sacrifice to me near LaGuardia, having having done it, <laughs> is noble. <laughs> it, it, it's meant to make it easier for the council members. I'm not sure that that always the, is the case. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's uh, uh, receive the FAF Treasurer's Report. Anne-Marie. Okay. Um, the FAF Treasurer's Report can be found on page 187 of your materials. And just to summarize, and I am now speaking to slide 193, to just say that we, um, at the end of June, we had net assets of $63,572,000, and that includes cash and investments of $73,650,000. Um, that's relatively consistent as far as the balances go to what we saw June a year ago. Um, and it is about a $1,000,000, um, 35000 better than the budget. Um, the variance relative to budget is driven really primarily at both the FASB, where it's a combination of lower expense on fellows and travel than were originally budgeted, and at the FAF, where it's largely driven by IT expenses, really being timed a bit different and running a little bit better than budget. Um, we did year to date, this date, um, put money into our own post-retirement um, 
obligations, both into our OPEB as well as our pension. Um, that was $750 million, and that was totally... Oh, no. Thousand, thank you. <laughs> Seven hundred and fifty thousand, totally consistent with um, the budget. You um, very big picture. Yes, <laughs> yes. Seven hundred and fifty thousand, and that was a hundred percent consistent with the budget. And just so everyone's aware, consistent with what we've done the last several years, we'll begin to deliberate the budget again in October of this year. And um, important in that process, we're going to review revenues and just see are there any important new trends in revenues that we need to take into consideration. As always, we're going to review the expense levels, our future contributions to our post-retirement plans as we do want to be fully funded over time. And then finally, um, our reserve levels where we're always thinking about the level of risk and funding risks and making sure that we have the appropriate level of reserves over time. So those are our, um, our plans for October. Questions for Anne-Marie. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And last but not least, um, our FAF president and CEO, Terry. Thank you, Chuck. Um, and Anne-Marie mentioned funding risk, and that's one of the things that I wanted to mention in my, in my public remarks today is probably one of the highest priorities of the FAF right now um, is our work relating to the Financial Choice Act, which is the bill that's been put forth by Republicans in the House of Representatives that would change a number of the financial regulatory reforms that were included in the Dodd-Frank Act back in 2010. Um, probably people are most familiar with some of the higher profile issues that are included in the Choice Act, but there's a number of other provisions that the House wants to repeal that were originally included. And one of those is the repeal of the GASB funding mechanism that was established in Dodd-Frank. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act, as, as everyone around this table knows, established an independent source of funding for the GASB, uh, very similar to the model that um, the FASB has had since Sarbanes-Oxley. The, uh, the GASB accounting support fee is a fee paid by certain broker-dealers in the municipal bond market based on secondary trades in that market. The, um, the Financial Choice Act passed the House of Representatives in June including the elimination of the GASB accounting support fee um, as part of our strategy to uh, educate members of Congress about the importance of, of the GASB funding mechanism. We did successfully generate a number of letters of support for the GASB from some key stakeholders, including the Council of Institutional Investors, the Congressional Accounting and CPA Caucus, and a coalition of public sector associations, including the National Governors Association, among others. Those letters of support are now part of the public record, the legislative record relating to this piece of legislation, and will be very valuable to us <clears throat> as we continue our work, turning our attention out of the Senate, um, where it will take its turn to address financial regulatory reform. Right now, we're expecting the Senate to take this up either later this year or early next year. We are continuing to actively engage with uh, key members of the Senate and their staffs. We want to make sure they understand the importance of the GASB's work and the independent funding that was provided in Dodd-Frank. So stay tuned on that. Uh, one of the key aspects of our mission is education. And from the FAF's perspective, that means uh, we see our role as educating stakeholders about the importance of what the FASB and the GASB do. And that outreach to stakeholders took a new direction in May when we released our first animated video called The Importance of Gap. We used narration and motion graphics to explain in less than three minutes why Gap is important and the role that the FASB and the GASB play in setting high quality accounting standards. Um, it definitely will help a broader audience understand what we do and the importance of the FASB and the GASB's work to the capital markets. So the Wall Street Journal just happened to stumble onto the video <laughs> shortly after its release and wrote a tongue-in-cheek story about how the foundation has created its own summer blockbuster. <laughs> um, thank you, Wall Street Journal, because that news coverage quickly drove more than 4,000 views of the video and has encouraged us to continue our uh, video form of storytelling. Um, one of the other areas where there's continued lack of understanding by our stakeholders is our funding. 
And so what we're working on now is a video that will be released later this year, which will help educate stakeholders about how our work is funded and why those funding streams are important to the independent standard setters. And then finally, um, I think Chris Cumming and Dave Bean touched on our technology transformation project, noting that we are more than halfway through um, the second year of our three-year technology transformation program. We, um, we had originally undertaken this, this project to address a number of pain points and um, what I would refer to as an underinvestment in technology over the years, so we were behind. Um, we're continuing to make good progress. Um, we are looking forward. We're going to be assessing our current publishing and fulfillment and, distrib and distribution platforms. We're continuing to integrate, as Dave mentioned, our, our CRM system and uh, other uh, operation, operational support systems, technology infrastructure, cybersecurity, and things like that. We're also taking steps to enhance our governance over technology to help ensure that we never find ourselves in a situation where we are uh, behind in technology. Our goal is to remain current. Um, I want to just emphasize that what we've done so far is significant. And um, I think, Dave, you, you talked about this. But I want to, uh, first of all, express my thanks to Mary Crotty, the FAF's chief operating officer, who has led the, the project with the significant <coughs> collaboration of the four folks I'm looking at across the table, Dave and Russ and Sue and Dave. So um, we couldn't have done it uh, without this collaborative effort. And we certainly have more to do, but uh, we have come a long way. And I'll stop there. OK, any questions for Terry? OK, thank you, Terry. Um, uh, with that, uh, we're concluding the public portion of our FAF Board of Trustees meeting. I want to thank everyone on the webcast uh, for joining us today and remind you that the next FAF Board of Trustees meeting will be held on Tuesday, November 14th. Thank you and have a good afternoon.